In today's rapidly changing world, we all have questions and we all want answers. It's on this program that we get our answers from the Word of God. It's time for another episode of A Relevant Word with longtime pastor and best selling author Carl Gallup. This is a relevant word with Pastor Carl Gallops from the Hickory Hammock Baptist Church in the Pensacola area. And Pastor Carl, it's good to have you back. Looking forward to another exciting show. Well, Kevin, it's always good to be with you. I'm looking forward to this. You know, before the show, we discuss a few things just to fill you in on what's going on. And Pastor says, well, this is what we're going to talk about today. And, and I am, I, my interest is really piqued because well, you hear good. about the story of Calvary from so many angles, so many focuses. Yeah. Yeah. But today, when, when the, some of the most powerful words in the New Testament, when Jesus himself says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's like, yeah. it's so, so many interpretations of that. It's like, was he confused or was, yeah. he, was he upset or was he left alone? And there's just so many ways you can look at that. And I'm so happy that that's what you're going to get into today. Yeah. And let me say to that person that's listening to us right now, um, you're, you're not going to be confused about this by the time this is over. And, and today you're going to hear the biblical contextual truth. And plus, I, I've got another shocking, stunning surprise for you that you've probably never heard, even if once I get started, you're thinking, oh, okay, yeah, well, I knew this. I've heard this before. This is cool. But, but just listen to this all the way through, because I'm going to be sharing some insight on some things that you may not have ever heard. And then there's one thing I'm going to share that I can almost guarantee that you've never heard before. So um, I'm really looking forward to getting into this. So anyway, uh, so Kevin, you asked me the question, was he confused yeah. on Calvary's Cross because of that statement he made? Yeah, it's like he did not know the answer. Yeah, yeah. It's like, okay, good. Yeah, no, that's, that's a perfect way to ask it. I really appreciate you uh, asking that. So let me just say, first of all, we're talking about Calvary's Cross. We're talking about Jesus delivering himself to the cross. And all during his ministry, he would tell his disciples things like, look, nobody takes my life from me. I'm going to lay it down of my own accord. In other words, uh, this is not something that I'm confused about. I know this is why I'm here. I know what I'm doing. I know where I'm going. I know what it's going to cost me. I know what I'm going to do when I get there. I know they're going to drive spikes in my hands and my feet. I know they're going to beat me and whip me half to death. I know what's coming. So he told them that basically over and over at appropriate times during the three years of public ministry. So you've got that. And then, of course, you've got the trial the night before or just, you know, some hours before he would go to the cross in Caiaphas's home in the wee hours of the morning, which basically was an illegal trial according to Hebrew law. But it doesn't matter. They did it anyway. You know, the deep state and fake news and all that. They just did. They, that's what they did. And so they had this mockery sham of a trial. Uh, and, and in that trial, the... The Bible tells us Jesus was, he just remained silent and and they didn't know what to do. And they started bringing in false witnesses. Well, they brought in false witnesses, but then even they stumbled over themselves and it became apparent that they were, well, that's breaking the law as it is today, even in our own courts. Under the ancient Jewish law, if you gave false witness against someone and you were found out, then you had to suffer the same punishment that you were seeking for that person. So all of those false witnesses should have gone to the cross that day. Caiaphas should have been arrested or kicked out of his position for holding an illegal trial and for allowing false witnesses. But the problem is, is that Jesus wouldn't answer. And that matches Isaiah 53, the prophecy that was given 700 years before Jesus was there, says, and before his accusers, he opened not his mouth. So, but it finally came down to Caiaphas saying, this man deserves to be crucified. Okay, why is that? So so did Caiaphas just make his mind up to crucify him? No, it came down to the question Jesus was waiting for. And Caiaphas kept asking him and asking him and asking him, and and Jesus never would say. Finally, Caiaphas said, well, just tell us plainly, are you the Christ, the Son of the living God? Now, those words don't hit us so much in, you know, 2,000 years later and in, in the Western world that we live in. But in that day, in that Hebrew mindset, here's what he was asking. 
tell us plainly, are you God in the flesh? Are you the one that's coming to represent God's image to us, as the Old Testament said, who would take upon uh, himself our salvation? Is that who you are? And Jesus answered, you have said it yourself. Or some translations say, say he answered, I am. Uh, and, and that's when Caiaphas stood up. Of course, he was thrilled. Finally, Jesus had hung himself. You see, Jesus did lay his life down. Nobody was going to take it from him. The false witnesses couldn't. Caiaphas's trial was illegal. Everybody knew it. They couldn't get him to, uh, to, uh, y- you know, to, to convict himself until finally Caiaphas asked the right question. And Jesus said, yes, I am. So Caiaphas stood. He, he tore his clothes. He pulled his hair, all this dramatic stuff. That was just all a part of the whole ritual of, of, of saying, we, this guy deserves crucifixion. Well, we know the rest of the story from there. They took him, took him Pontius Pilate. Finally, they, they took him out. They flogged him almost to death. Then they they drove the spikes in his hands and his feet, uh, 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 you know, a, a thief on each side of him. And there they are on Golgotha's hill, the three of them, Jesus in the middle. And for six hours, he suffered in a way. I'll have to do this on another show sometime and just describe what they're just, just describe exactly what happens at a crucifixion and what was happening that day. But right now, I want to get to the point of what he said. So he's there for six hours. He's suffocating, slowly suffocating to death for six hours. Plus, he's been beaten. Strips of flesh, big chunks of flesh are hanging off of his body. Flies are swarming. The heat of the day, he can't scratch his nose. A fly goes up his nose. He can't get it out. I mean, it's just horrible. It's just horrible. He's stripped down uh, to almost nudity. People are mocking him. Uh, they're 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 you know making fun of him, saying he he saved others. Let him save himself. His hands and his feet are pierced. There he is. Then he says, in the final moments of his life, the Bible says he cried out in a loud voice, "Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani." That is Hebrew. And you will find it in Hebrew dictionaries or, or Hebrew uh, uh, interlinears uh, it, 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 for um, Psalm 22, the first verse of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are my words so far from you? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Now, that's where people ask, why did he say that? Of all things, I mean, everything's coming to pass, just like he said. He laid his life down. Thank you, Jesus. We're, 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 we, we adore you. We worship you for what you're doing. But in the last moments, some of the last words, and those weren't the final words, but they were right at the final words. The final words were, it is finished. Okay? But those words sounds like... Jesus is confused about something. I mean, you know, if, if he told his disciples, I'm going to lay it down. If he told his disciples, nobody's going to take my life from me. Uh, if he told his disciples, this is why I'm coming. This is why I'm here. I know what I'm doing. I know where I'm going. Uh, you need to have faith. You need to go with me. Uh, don't worry. Three days later, I'm rising from the grave and all of these things that he told him. And then he cries out, where are you, God? Why did you leave me? Why won't you even answer me? What's happening? I mean, that's basically what he said. In common English, that's what he said. All right, but here's the answer. Jesus was not confused. Now, again, many of you, as I start talking, and, and you, you might be thinking right now that, you know, well, I, well, I know this. This is cool, but I, I know this. But hang on. I'm going to share some things with you you don't know. And when we come back from our brief break, you're going to hear um, something really shocking that I can almost guarantee you don't know. But watch. He's on the cross. He cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is the first verse of Psalm 22. That's the first verse. He recited it word for word. What was he doing? He is being a good rabbi. What do you mean, Pastor Carl? Because that's how the rabbis of ancient days taught the scriptures. They would recite the first verse of an entire chapter or passage, or if it's a particular passage, they would recite the first verse. Because you got to remember the ancient people, they had scrolls. The people didn't have Bibles in their homes. The, the Hebrew people didn't have scrolls in their homes. The, the synagogues had them. The temple, the priest had them, and the synagogues had them. So, so 
you know, how how did they read the Bibles? Well, the 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 rabbis, the the the, the lecturer for the day would pull a scroll and would read it. We got a, an, an example of Jesus doing that as he began his ministry. He goes into the synagogue and the Bible says, and he opened it to the place where it says. And then he starts quoting, see, because there were no chapters and verses. Those were added in the, you know, way, way after the time of Jesus, those chapters and verses. So he's saying, go look at what we now would say is Psalm 22. He's saying, go look at it because he recited the first verse. Now, remember, he's suffocating. He's going up and down on a cross, so he can't say the whole thing. So he recites the first verse and, and and calls their attention to it. So when you go and you read Psalm 22, it's what's called a compound prophecy. That is, it starts off, David wrote it. David is talking about himself. He's running from people that are attacking him, and he's saying, God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far off? You're not answering my prayers, etc." cetera. Uh, but then it morphs. It morphs into something shocking. When we come back from the break in a little bit, I'm going to share with you exactly what those shocking elements are, and then one or two of those elements, I can almost promise you, you've never heard them before, but they're going to come right from the Bible, right from the Bible, and you will see and hear for yourself. But he was directing them, Kevin, to Psalm 22, because what Psalm 22 says and what David saw is what was happening there that day on the cross. Like when we first started just a few moments ago, I said there's so many different focuses you could take on that. And there's one that I didn't know about. Well, just you wait. You were right. You said, here's one that you are not. You haven't heard, baby. <laughs> but just wait. <laughs> it gets right. really uh, stunning in a moment. After the break, we're going to find out what the shocking thing is that uh, we don't know yet. So yes. Yeah. This is a relevant word with Pastor Carl Gallus. We'll be back right after the break. For more on Pastor Carl or to listen to his podcast anytime, visit carlgallops.com. Pastor Carl, or to listen to his podcast anytime, visit carlgallops.com. This is a relevant word with Pastor Carl Gallops. And Pastor, in the first segment, we were talking about when Jesus cried those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yeah. And it, yeah. it's almost sounding like that Jesus was confused. Now we know what you said is that's not the case at all. On the contrary, it's not. So if you could just recap yeah. us on that and then lay, right. give us that, and then that dive bit of information yeah. that you said is shocking. Yeah, no, no. The truth is is absolutely stunning. And again, for that one that's listening right now, just wrapped around the radio, <laughs> can't wait to hear. Let me just say to you, ma'am, let me say to you, sir, um, uh, even if as I start, you're thinking, okay, yes, I've heard this, but... Hang on, because I've got a few things I can almost guarantee you've not heard. All right, so so you're right, Kevin. Uh, that's what he cried out. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's not even the whole first verse. In fact, the first verse reads, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in, in the New Testament, it'll say, Eloi, Eloi, lava sarakthani, that's Hebrew. And then it says, so why are you so far from saving me or helping me? Why are you so far from the words of my groaning? And then it goes on more complaining. Oh, God, oh, God, my God, why are you not there? You know, if you, as you keep reading and you're thinking, why would he say those words? I mean, he delivered himself there. He came to be our savior. Why is he now mad at God is what it sounds like. But no, he's directing as a rabbi, as a teacher would do. He's directing his students. He's directing the crowd that day, the audience, if you will, watching him suffer to Psalm 22. Why? David wrote it. He wrote it one time thousand years before Jesus was on the cross. Remember that. Now, this is a compound prophecy. That means it starts off talking about David, but then it morphs. All of a sudden, you're going to see David 
is taken through a time portal or something, a time warp. He's in another dimension. He's taken into the future, and he is planted at the foot of the cross. He hears what the people are seeing. He sees what's happening. He sees what Jesus is seeing. I'm going to show you that. And and it's... It, and and David, David just the rest of the Psalm 22, he's just enraptured by the whole thing because he sees the future. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So Psalm 22, he starts off, my God, my God, why are you forsaking me? Why are you so far from helping me You're from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry out to you day and night, but you do not answer. Uh, you don't even answer by night. And, 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 and I'm not even silent. I pray out to you. A- anyway, the whole thing, he's, he's complaining. David's complaining. He doesn't think he thinks God's taken his eyes off of him. But then then it begins to morph. Listen to this, folks. I'm just going to read some selected passages. You can read the whole Psalm 22 yourself, and you can see the morphing, but watch this. Verse 6, but I am a worm and not a man, scorned by the people, despised by everyone. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads, saying, he trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. He saved others. Let him save himself. Let him deliver himself, since the Lord delights in him. That's the very thing that the New Testament records. The people were saying, about Jesus a thousand years later. But wait, it goes on. It says, many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me, roaring lions they're like, tearing my tear, tearing at their prey, opening their mouths wide against me. I just want to stop real quick here. Th- those are pretty words and they're poetic words, but the bulls of Bashan, the foothills of Bashan are below the, 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 they're in the foothills of Mount Hermon in the very north of Israel. For the longest of time, and I don't have time to go in it now, maybe another show, but the ancient Hebrews thought that that area is exactly where the demonic encroachment during Noah's day came, when the sons of da- God came unto the daughters of men. It's all through their literature. They believed it. They saw it. There may be something to it. It's in four or five different places in the Old Old Testament scripture, you have to know what you're looking at, but once you do, you can't unsee it. And it's referred to here. Bulls of Bashan refer to the demonic realm. And to prove to you, those of you that are listeners of the Bible, what does the New Testament say that Satan sometimes acts like? A roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. What does Psalm 22 say? They're like roaring lions, tearing their praise, opening their mouths wide, seeking whom they can devour. All right, now Jesus continues to talk. At least, you know, David's talking, but he's seeing this. And so he's, he's, it's the mouth of Jesus. I'm poured out like water. All of my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It's melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt. Uh, my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. Remember when Jesus cried out, I thirst, I thirst. And then it says, you lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men have encircled me. That's exactly what happened on the cross. Watch this. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all of my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them by casting lots for my clothing. I mean, I could go on and on with this, folks. I'm going to stop because I want to explain some of this. But that's all in the New Testament. Every bit of that happened to Jesus. The mocking, the tongue sticking to the roof of his mouth, his bones out of joint, his hands pierced, his feet pierced, gambling for his clothing, rolling dice. That's in the New Testament. The Roman soldiers did. How could David know? None of this happened to David. None of these things ever happened to David. He was never crucified. Nobody gambled for his clothing. Who's he talking about? He's taken into the future. He is, he is in a state of prayer about himself. And in the midst of it, God's saying, oh, yeah, big boy, you think you're suffering? Let me show you who's going to suffer. And let me show you what it's going to cost. And let me show you this is for all of humanity. Now, I've got your life. Calm down. Be a man. Suck it up. Rub some dirt on it. But I'm going to show you what it costs for your salvation. And he takes him to the foot of the cross. There's no way around it. There's no way around it. He sees the demonic. He sees Satan himself. He hears what the people are saying. He looks at a crucifixion. He sees that crucifixion wasn't even invented when David spoke these words. The Persians would do that later on. He's doing, and then the Romans would perfect it. David seeing it and writing about it 1,000 years BC. So that's why Jesus said, 
Go look at Psalm 22. That's basically what he was saying. Now let's go back to the New Testament. Jesus is hanging there. The next thing that is said in the Gospel of Mark, and I think John as well, that after he said that, it says, seeing how Jesus died and hearing what he said, the Roman centurion said, we have just killed the Son of God. Surely this man is the Son of God. How a Roman centurion, he got it. He knew what Jesus was talking about. And and people say, well, why would a Roman soldier know that? No, no, he's not a Roman soldier. He's a centurion. He's an officer. He's settled in an area. He's in command of the troops over an entire region. And these people were trained and instructed. One of the first things you do in a very religious area, like if the whole area is Muslim, if the whole area is Christian, or if the whole area is Jewish today, our ambassadors are told, read their religious literature. Read their stuff. Get involved in their faith to the point that you at least understand it because these are the people you're ruling over. You've got to know what their fears are, what their anxieties are, uh, what their religious beliefs are. So this guy knew. He knew the Jewish scriptures. Evidence of that is in the book of Acts where another Roman centurion after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, calls for Peter the leader of them all now, to come to his house and tell him about Jesus. And the man and his family are saved. And that's in the book of Acts. That was a Roman centurion. Some people think it might have been this guy right here. But so here we are at the foot of the cross. Jesus knows, of course, what he's the one that set it up from the beginning. He's God in the flesh. So as he's there, he calls out to the people and basically says, now, now that you hear what you're saying, now that you see what you're seeing, now that you're watching these gamblers for my clothing, now that you're seeing the, my feet, hands, and pierced, now go to Psalm 22 and read what David wrote a thousand years ago. And when the centurion thought about it, and he knew, and he knew where that verse came from. The Bible says, and it doesn't say he got down on his knees, but I think he did. I, I think he got down on his knees and he said, oh my gosh, we have just crucified the Son of God. Surely this man was the Son of God. Because he un- understands David had a vision of Messiah. And now everything that's in that vision from a thousand years earlier is happening. Now here's the really stunning thing. When you take that verse... My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? In Hebrew, it reads from right to left. When you read that through, that phrase, so far from helping me, so far from helping me, that's five fingers on my hand, five words in the English. In the Hebrew, it's one word that expresses so far from helping me. And in the middle of that word is the word yud, shin, vav, ayin. It's spelled that way, Yud, Shin, Vav, Ayin, the letters. For those of you that know anything about Hebrew, it spells Yeshua. Yeshua is the Hebrew word for Jesus. His name is in the first verse, hidden, embedded within a phrase that says, so far from helping me, Yud, Shin, Vav, Ayin, Yeshua. Jesus says, go look at that verse. It even has my name in it. And then read the chapter. And when it came to the centurion's mind, he said, this is the Son of God. We have just crucified the Messiah. Is that stunning enough for you, Kevin? I can still talk for an hour. You were right. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I can still talk about for an hour. There's still more things there that I'm looking at the time, and I'm I'm frustrated that I might have said too much, but uh, because there's so much more I need to talk about. I've never heard that angle. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, not to parse your words. You're, no, you're right. That is an interpretation, but it's, it's way more than an angle or an interpretation. Everything I said is exactly what the Scripture says. Everything. I mean, I read to you from Psalm 22, um, uh, and, and that's exactly what it was. Jesus was not confused. We know he was there on purpose. But then when you keep reading, you read the, the words that people were saying. You read the description of what's happening right down to the gambling for this clothing under his feet. And then we go back to the New Testament, and the Bible says, seeing how he died and hearing what he said. In other words, he did die with his hand spiked. He did die with his bones out of joint. He did die thirsting the whole time, crying out, I thirst, I thirst. He did die with people mocking him with those very words. And then it says, seeing how he died, and then hearing what he said, what did he say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting Psalm 22. So the centurion puts it all together, and he says, this is Messiah. This is the Son of God. This is what David saw. 
And he realized it. And then, of course, Jesus' name being in that phrase, so far from helping me, that's right there in the Hebrew. You can't deny it. It's there. So it's not really an angle or an interpretation. It's the biblical contextual truth of what really happened at Calvary that day. This is A Relevant Word with Pastor Carl Gallops. Thanks for being with us. May the Lord bless you and keep you always. Thank you for joining us today. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode of A Relevant Word with Pastor Carl Gallops. You can find Pastor Carl at carlgallops.com.